We haven't forgotten about Revelation chapter 6. We're going to be there in a few weeks. But as we look at Revelation chapter 6, we are going to notice that this is the time that God pours out His judgments on the world. But before that happens, we want to look at the subject here of the rapture taking place before this time of judgment. So therefore, it's referred to as a pre-tribulational rapture, meaning that it happens before the time that God pours out His wrath on the world. Beginning in Revelation 6, of course, begins the seven seal judgments, then the seven trumpet judgments, and then the seven bowl judgments. God unleashes His wrath upon the world. It is different than Christians who are now suffering for their faith, and certainly Christians have suffered throughout Christian history. And the Word of God promises, yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And that is certainly true. Uh, the belief in a rapture doesn't mean we don't believe that Christians shouldn't suffer. Christians have suffered throughout Christian history and will until Christ comes for His own. The distinction, though, during the tribulation period, it is, yes, it has persecution of Christians by evil people, including a, rule, a world ruler known as the Antichrist, but the tribulation period is distinctly different in that God is pouring out His wrath upon those who dwell upon the earth. It is God's fury that is being unleashed in these 21 judgments that fall upon the earth, upon those who have rejected Him. So we're going to look at two things that I believe happen before God unleashes His judgment, and that will be the issue of the rapture, and secondly, what we refer to as the judgment seat of Christ. This is not a judgment of heaven and hell. It is an issue of judgment for believers of their works. That is to say that believers, when in heaven, Christ will give out rewards as those that have faithfully served Him that are His own. And we're going to look at that in the coming weeks. All right? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's go ahead and stand as we read the Word of God this morning. <coughs> The Apostle Paul's writing to this church that is under a great strain of persecution and they're suffering for the cause of Jesus and they have some concerns. And so Paul is going to deal with those concerns and he's seeking to comfort them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse number 13. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your precious word. Help us, Lord, as we look into your word this morning that we would be compelled to greater faithfulness as we think upon the return of Christ in the air to take His own, that until that trumpet sounds, may we as Your people be found faithful serving You and living for Your honor and glory. Bless, Lord, the teaching of Your Word. May it be applied by the power of Your Holy Spirit that we would live a life as a church that is ready for the coming of Christ. Bless your truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Back, if you remember, back in March 8, 2014, there was an airplane that was flying from Malaysia to Beijing, China. 239 souls were on board, and in its route to China, it disappeared. Most likely, it wrecked in the Indian Ocean. Only just a few a while ago, I believe a few weeks ago or months ago, they found some wreckage of it, very small portions of it, but the majority of the plane filled with people was never found. Many ships were used to find the airplane. Many planes, over 10 countries, were involved trying to find the people in the airplane that wrecked in the ocean. 
They couldn't find them. Headlines read, what could have happened to 239 people? Another headline, how could he be, how could he be here one moment and be gone the next? And that is exactly what happened to that flight and all 239 souls on board. According to the Bible, a time is coming when this thing will happen on a more global scale. A day is coming when millions of people will suddenly vanish from the face of the earth without a trace. When that event occur occurs, calling the FBI will be of no use. But unlike most modern-day books on the subject of the rapture and on Bible prophecy, Paul's concern was not just doctrinal, but it was pastoral. He was writing to people who were suffering and were wondering if they had missed the rapture, if they had missed the rapture. And so they are, he is concerned as a pastor for the people of God. His intent was not to give a detailed description of the rapture, but to comfort the Thessalonians who had lost fellow believers to death. Other rapture passages that we read this morning in John 14 and 1 Corinthians 15 also provide comfort and practical encouragement to keep on keeping on and serving God until Christ comes back. The Thessalonians, these Christians, their fear, their fear was that they were, during this time period, referred to as the day of the Lord, a time when God will unleash His awesome wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world. Now think about that. The Thessalonians thought they were in the day of the Lord, and they were concerned, thinking, what has happened? Now, if they were not taught by Paul that there would not be any rapture before the tribulation period, they should have been excited, not confused, because they were entering the tribulation period knowing that Jesus is coming back soon. But that's not the case. They think, and they're under the understanding that something's wrong. Did we miss the rapture? We are in the midst of suffering. Is this the day of the Lord that we're in? That is their thinking. If they had been taught that they would go through the tribulation, they wouldn't have grieved for believers that died. They would have said, that's great that Uncle Charlie died in faith in Jesus and doesn't have to suffer persecution under the Antichrist. This is a great thing that Uncle Charlie died before this time that we are in. But that's not what was happening. They were sad because several believers had died and Christ had not come back for his own yet. They feared that the rapture came and somehow something is, is going wrong. And of course, they were not in the tribulation period. They were not under a time of God's wrath. But they did know, as Paul knew, that the rapture was imminent. That is to say that the rapture could happen at any moment. In fact, earlier, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, the Apostle Paul wrote to them, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. How ye, the Thessalonian believers, you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven. And the word wait has the idea of anticipation. That Christ could come back at any moment for them. Hebrews 9.28 tells us the same thing. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Unto them that look for Him shall He appear. That is, He's going to suddenly come. In fact, it refers often to coming as a thief in the night. Here in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, he tells, Paul writes them, writes them and tells them, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now, Paul is not writing about those who sleep during the church service. Not that that would ever happen here. He's not writing about those who have physically fallen asleep as much as he's referring to those who had died and their bodies have gone to sleep in the grave. They've come to faith in Christ. But they physically died before Christ came back. The word sleep or asleep can be used of normal sleep, but it's also used to refer to the believer's bodies when they die. For example, in John chapter 11, when Lazarus died, and the, the report came to Jesus that he had been dead. Jesus describes Lazarus, who had been dead for several days. He says, he tells the apostles, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. Now, he wasn't referring to the fact that he was taking a nap that he, afternoon, but that he had died and his body had been laid in the grave. In Acts 7, 
Stephen is preaching, he's persecuted for his faith in Christ. They drag him outside the city, and the Bible says they stoned him to death. He kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, Lord, he says, lay not their sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. That is, he physically died. We see this as used for as a description of death. It is important to remember that in the New Testament, the word sleep applies to the body, but never to the soul. Remember when Jesus was dying on the cross, he turned to the repentant thief and said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He didn't say you're going to go to sleep for a few thousand years, but later on you're going to join me in paradise. He told him, Today, this day, you will physically die here, but you will awake in paradise with me. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Paul said himself, describing his own death, in which his body would fall asleep in the grave, he said in St. Corinthians, 5 8 to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. In fact, in Revelation 6, that we're going to study in a few weeks, John sees before the throne of God those who have been killed for their faith, and they are not sleeping. They're actually talking to God, praying to God, praising God. So when the Bible refers to sleep, as it does here in verse 11, it's not referring to soul sleep, the doctrine that says once you die, you're going to go to sleep and that's it, it's all over. No, the body goes to sleep, that is, it's no longer alive, but the soul of the believer goes immediately into the presence of Almighty God. Paul's purpose here was distinctly pastoral. He urged the church to use his teaching, verse 18, to comfort one another with these words. Brethren, I would not have you be ignorant Brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Notice, he doesn't say, I'm not writing to you to tell you that as a Christian, when someone that you love as a Christian dies, that you shouldn't cry. No, it's expected that there would be sorrow when a believer dies. It is normal. In fact, it would be abnormal for someone that you love dies and you're happy. And you go party. That, that is strange. The idea here, is that when a loved one dies in faith in Christ, you sorrow, you weep, you cry, you mourn, but not like those who don't know Christ. You don't go out there, pull out your hair, and take your life. There's still, there's hope if they died in faith in Christ. They are absent here, but they're present there with the Lord. You don't respond as an unbeliever and go out and say, oh, I'm going to go kill myself, it's all over. Listen, life for me to live is Christ, Paul says, and to die is gain. Yes, we love our spouses, we love our family and our children. And yes, God is in control of their life. And yes, we sorrow when they die. But if they're believers and believers, we don't sorrow like the world. This life is not all that there is. There is an eternity. There is a reality of dwelling in the presence of God forever for the believer. So Paul is writing and saying, don't be like the pagans. There's no hope when they die. They want to kill themselves. And in some cultures, when a husband dies, they'll kill the wife too. It's a hopeless situation when death comes for those that don't know Christ. But I'm writing you about this coming of Christ for his own to remind you that you're not hopeless if you have Christ. You're not to be like the lost who are full of despair and hopelessness in the face of of death. A believer should grieve, but his grief should be tempered and informed by the word of God. He will grieve, he will cry, but yet he has a firm foundation on the reality of who Christ is and the salvation that he has in him. This morning, we're going to look at four aspects of this teaching of the rapture. We're going to look at the pillars of the rapture. They're built, the rapture is like a three-legged stool built upon the death, resurrection, and word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, we're going to look at the participants in the rapture, that is, those who died in Christ and those who are alive and have faith in Christ when he comes in the air for his own. And then we're going to look at the order, and it breaks it down here simply in 1 Thessalonians, and then some implications in our life. So let's begin, first of all, with the pillars that support this doctrine of the rapture of Christ coming in the air for his own. 
What is the first pillar? Well, I've mentioned that. The first pillar is the death of Christ. Verse 14. For if we believe that Christ died. Let me pause here. The word if does not suggest uncertainty or doubt, but rather a logical sequence. Paul is saying if in the sense of since, based on the fact that Christ died, these things logically follow. Christ in his death satisfies the righteous demands of God. Christ in his death for his own, absorbed in himself, took to himself in his body the holy wrath and fury of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 reminds us, For he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God demands perfect righteousness, that we perfectly obey Him and live a righteous life, and no one's done that. We've broken the law of God. But what we couldn't do, Christ did for us. He lived that perfect righteous life. He went to the cross bearing our sins, and the wrath of God, the anger of God, because He is righteous and holy and must punish sin. The wrath of God was unleashed on His own Son. As Isaiah says in Isaiah 53, it pleased the Father to bruise Him, to crush Him. God's wrath was fully and totally satisfied, quenched, appeased in the person of Christ on the cross. Christians should expect to suffer, but not the wrath of God. The wrath of God, there is no more wrath for the believer. Christ has drunk the cup of God's wrath poured out on the cross of Calvary. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. This is the first basis. How do we know we're going to escape the fury of God's wrath? Small pictures that we've seen in the worldwide flood. A small picture of God's wrath and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Small pictures. But those were previews to the main movie. <laughs> the main picture in Revelation. It is a time when God pours out His wrath on earth dwellers. How can a man escape the wrath of God? Only in Christ. Only in Christ is there escape from the wrath of God. For His wrath has been satisfied in His Son on the cross. That is a reason you can expect as a believer to escape God's wrath, not because you deserve it, not because as Americans we simply just don't want to suffer, but because wrath of God has been satisfied in Christ. That is the first basis. Secondly, the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection of Christ. Verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. The resurrection is extremely important. Christ is not on the cross. He's not on the cross. He was on the cross. He did lay down his life on the cross, but he is not on the cross. He has risen from the dead the third day. And in his bodily resurrection, it is the Father's state of approval on the work of the Son. It is the Father saying to the world, I accept my Son's life in the behalf of those whom He died for. I am fully satisfied with what He has done. The Bible states that God can be, quote, just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Romans 4.25 reminds us who Jesus was delivered for our offenses and was raised for our justification. How do I know that the Father will accept the Son's sacrifice on my behalf? His resurrection. His resurrection is testimony that He truly did pay for all our sins on the cross of Calvary. He died. He rose again. Even so. What is Paul doing? He's making a connection. Christ died for us. He rose again from the dead for us. 
Even so, now there's a connection, as Jesus would, lay, would say in John 14, 19, because I live, ye shall also live, speaking to believers. Because I live, ye shall live. 1 Corinthians 6, 14, God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. To further calm their fears, Paul reassured the believers that them, that is believers, also which sleep, that is they died, in Jesus will God bring with him. God will bring with him the souls of those who have died in faith in Christ for they could receive their new bodies, glorified bodies, bodies that are physical, that are perfect, bodies that it could even eat but don't need to eat. So then why would you eat? Because eating tastes good. It was good food. And like the body of Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he told the disciples in the Gospel of Luke, give me a piece of fish and honeycomb, and he ate it. And he says, look, and handle me, a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see me have. He had a physical body. He didn't need to eat, but he chose to eat. So that same type of physical body, when Christ comes back with those that have died in faith, he comes for they can receive the resurrected, perfect, glorified bodies. Thirdly, the other third basis here is the word of Christ. Verse 15, first part. The word of Christ. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. When Paul's describing Jesus coming for his own, we may ask, Paul, where did you get this information from? ABC, NBC, Fox, CNN, Oprah? No. He got it directly from the Lord. He got it directly from the Lord by the word of the Lord. That is an Old Testament way that was typical of prophetic revelation. It was the word of the Lord. Isaiah, in Isaiah 1.10 says, Hear, hear the word of the Lord. Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 1.4, And the word of the Lord came unto me. So, when Paul says this phrase, This we say unto you by the word of the Lord, he's saying this is the authoritative revelation of Almighty God in Christ to me. This is not just an opinion, it is not speculation, it is the word of the Lord. He's giving them comfort. He's comforting them. Why? Because we deserve the wrath of God by nature. And yet, if Christ died, if he rose again from the dead, if Paul has Christ's word on it, that we will not, we are not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a comfort to the people of God in the, in the city of Thessalonica. Secondly, we now move to the participants of the rapture. The participants of the rapture. Verse 15 again, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. When Paul the Apostle describes the coming of the Lord, the term the coming comes from a Greek word parousia. The Greek word parousia has, it is a description of when a, a God made a glorious appearing. Or when a king would arrive at a city, he would come as a God-man in glorious apparel. And he was to be honored by everyone as everyone would come to meet the arrival of this God-king. In verse 16, the apostle describes the glory and the pomp that will accompany the parousia of the Lord. He also assured the Thessalonians that all Christians, both those who died in Christ, that is, they died with explicit faith in Christ, and those who died in Christ and those who are alive in Christ when he comes, they will both participate, living and dead Christians. The two groups which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord, and the second group, them which are asleep. Now what is interesting here is that when Paul describes this, what is going on here, he includes himself. 
In verse 15, he says, By this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we, which are, not you, we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord should not prevent them which are asleep. He includes himself. In fact, he did the same thing in 1 Corinthians, as Brother Ed read this morning. When he described this event, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. What is a mystery? It's not a mystery. It's what you watch on TV. A mystery in the Bible is a truth that God did not reveal in the Old Testament. But now the truth is being revealed in the New Covenant. And he says this, not that the coming of Jesus was a mystery, but this coming in the air for his own was a mystery. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. What are we saying here? Paul is speaking of the eminency of the coming of Christ for his own. You have passages that describe our Lord's coming in two ways that seem almost contradictory. At one point, it can happen at any second, like a thief in the night, right? Thieves don't call you, hey, I'm coming at 9 o'clock, bro. I'm coming to take your TV at 9. I'll be done by 9.15. Don't worry about it. Right? A thief just comes. And yet, the second coming of Christ comes with major signs. You can't miss it, man. Even a blind person would see it. Major. I mean... Two-thirds of the earth's population being killed by God in supernatural catastrophe. That's pretty, that's a big sign. Sign after sign after sign before his coming. And yet, the Bible has verses that say there's no sign, and then he comes. Well, which one is it? It's both. Because he comes for his own in the air, but he comes with his own at his second coming. And when it, come to the, when it comes to this first aspect of the rapture, Paul includes himself. Man, we, we could be caught up at any moment. This could happen. D.L. Moody used to say, I never preach a sermon without thinking that possibility, that possibly the Lord may come before I preach another. Dr. G. Campbell Morgan, a distinguished British pastor, said, I never begin my work in the morning without thinking that perhaps God may interrupt my work and begin his own. I'm not looking for death. I am looking for him. What was the preacher saying? I'm not looking for the undertaker, but for the upper taker. I'm ready to any moment. And listen, he knew that this could happen. This is a mystery. Not that no one knows what it's about, but it wasn't revealed in the past, but now it's being revealed by God through the Apostle Paul. Those who died go up first. Who died in faith in Christ go up first. Their bodies to join their souls, and those that are alive never die. Now let's look thirdly at the order of the rapture. Beginning in verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. So let's walk step by step through verse 16 and 17. First, the Lord himself will return for his people. Jesus receives his own in the air. At his second coming, according to Matthew chapter 25, the only people that the Lord snatches up is when he uses his angel to snatch up those who are wicked to throw them into hell. But at the rapture, he's snatching up his own. He's taking his own to himself. He doesn't send angels, he does it himself. But at his second coming, he uses angels to snatch up the wicked to judge. But at the rapture, Jesus comes himself for his own. Secondly, Jesus will descend from heaven where he has been since, his accession, uh, uh, since he ascended to heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. Third, when Jesus comes down from heaven, he will do so with a shout. This has a military ring to it. Like a commander calling out his troops to fall in line. It's like the authoritative voice of Christ when he appeared before the tomb of dead Lazarus who had been dead for four days. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And what did Lazarus do? He came forth. He had no choice. <laughs> he came forth. And so Christ comes with an authoritative shout to call his own unto him. Fourth, the voice of the archangel will sound. 
In Jude 9, the only archangel we know of is Michael the archangel. Scripture doesn't say whether it's he or another one. But whoever it is, he, this archangel, adds his voice to the Lord's shout of command. Fifth, but with the Lord's command and the archangel's voice, there's added the trump, or the trumpet of God. Now in Scripture, trumpets were used for different, different reasons. Uh, and according to Numbers 10.10, 10, to announce the feasts of Israel, trumpets were used. 2 Samuel 6, to announce celebrations, trumpets were used. To sound an alarm for war, Numbers 10, a trumpet was used. But trumpets, we could say their purpose is basically twofold in the Old Testament. First of all, in Exodus 19, a trumpet was used to assemble the people of God. They would blow out the trumpet in order for God's people to assemble. And the second purpose of trumpets in the Old Testament, according to Zechariah 1 and 9, was the signal deliverance for the people of God. Sixth, after the trumpet sounds, sixth, the dead in Christ shall rise first. In other words, those that are alive at the rapture do not precede those who are dead. Those who have died in Christ, their bodies will join their souls first, and we come after that. Verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Harpazo is the word translated caught up. It refers to a strong, irresistible act. Think of a father who has a little, a little a son, a two-year-old. And he's running. He's about to run in the street and there's traffic. The father doesn't say, oh, Johnny, can you please stop, Johnny? That's not what he does. He grabs the son and he snatches him with force from danger. That's the picture of caught up. We see examples of this in the Bible. We think of Enoch. In Hebrews 11, the word of God tells of Enoch who lived before the flood. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Right before God unleashed his wrath in a universal flood that covered the world, God snatched up, he caught up. He raptured Enoch before the time of judgment in the Old Testament. Then we find the case with Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 2. How God sends a chariot of fire to take Elijah up. And Elijah, like Enoch, never died. He was taken directly into heaven. Philip, in Acts 8, got raptured. But he got raptured not this way. He got raptured this way. He had a sideways rapture. Uh, one moment... He's in Samaria preaching, and God the Holy Spirit raptures him sideways, and he's in, the, he's in the desert called Gaza, witnessing the Ethiopian eunuch. When God is done, God transports him sideways. So unfortunately, he didn't go up, he went sideways. But he was snatched up. Now let me see some differences between the rapture and the second coming. At the rapture, Christ comes to reward believers. That take us to the Father's home, where there is the judgment seat of Christ for believers. At the second coming, Christ comes to judge the earth. At the rapture, the Lord snatches away true believers from the earth. He comes in the air for his own. At his second coming, he's snatching up any believers. He is snatching up unbelievers in order to send them to eternal judgment. At the rapture, Unbelievers remain behind. Believers are taken up. Unbelievers are left behind. The second coming is the very opposite. Unbelievers at the second coming, snatched up, sent to judgment. Believers, that those that come to faith, mostly Israelites, but some Gentiles that come to faith during the tribulation period, what happens to them? They enter the, they enter the millennium in normal human bodies. Isaiah speaks of them having children. Isaiah 2 speaks of little kids playing with snakes that are no longer poisonous. The lamb is laying down with the wolf. How can you have little babies, little toddlers, because people are still having babies? They're people who come to faith in Christ at the second coming. 
The unconverted are snatched up, sent to judgment. Believers that have come to faith enter into the millennium with normal human bodies and a perfect world, the millennial reign of Christ. At the rapture, lastly, believers will receive glorified bodies. At the second coming, no one will receive glorified bodies. Believers enter with their normal human bodies into the millennial reign of of Christ. Listen, if there is no rapture, if there is no rapture, just the same coming of Christ, Christ comes, he snatches up all believers and all unbelievers, unbelievers are thrown into hell, all believers receive the resurrected bodies. Who are the people in the millennium with normal human bodies? Where do they come from? There's a major problem there. Well, the, the way we, 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 we solve this puzzle is that there's two aspects to the second coming. He comes in the rapture for his own. He comes at the second coming with his own. He comes in the rapture to bring up his own, to bless. He comes at the second coming to judge the world and establish the earthly aspect of his kingdom. Number four, the practical implications of the rapture. The first one is in verse 18 of our text. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. He's writing them, and he continues to write to them. He comforts them. Hey, you guys, you're, you're not in the day of the Lord. You're not, during the, you're not in the great tribulation period. You haven't been left behind. You don't have to mourn those that have died in Christ. They're not going to miss out on the rapture. In fact, they'll be a little bit ahead of you when Christ comes in the air for his own. This is comfort for believers who had died in faith in Christ. He, he cares for them. He wants to help them live the Christian life faithfully on earth. But let us look at a couple of other implications that the rapture has in our life. The truth of the rapture should cause us, number one, to be steadfast. Steadfast. What does steadfast mean? Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. James 5.8. James writes, Be also patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. It draws near. Establish your hearts means be resolute. Have firm courage. Have an attitude of total commitment. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Don't say, oh, I can't handle it. My trials will never end. I quit. Don't do that. The coming of the Lord is right around the corner. He's coming quickly for his own. Hang in there. It's just right around the corner. Stay faithful to the Lord. Establish your heart. Be firm in your conviction. Be steadfast. Don't quit. Well, I'm going to serve the Lord, but if things don't go exactly, I, I quit, I quit. Don't quit. The truth that Christ could come at any moment for his own ought to encourage firmness of commitment. Amen. Amen. Secondly, the truth of the rapture should cause us to be faithful to church. Okay, Pastor, I knew you would say something like that. I, I didn't make it, I didn't write this passage. Hebrews 10 an exhortation to Hebrews who are thinking of, some of them already stopped coming to church, assembling with other believers. He's writing in Hebrews 10, 24, and he says, Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. In other words, we gather together to worship God true, but we also gather together for we can help each other live for God, right? For we can encourage each other to serve the Lord. Provoke. Sometimes the word provoke is used in a negative sense. You want to provoke someone to anger? Hey, man, you look ugly. <laughs> your mama, blah, 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 wears combat boots. Blah, 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 and you're just provoking and provoking. Why? Because you want them to get angry, right? Some people are quite good at that. <laughs> provoke, provoke, provoke. The Bible uses it in a positive sense. You're to come, yes, to worship God in the assembly, but you're here because you need other Christians to stay faithful. Amen. We're to encourage each other. It is a sad day. When a man says, I don't want to go to church because people are trying, they're telling me I need to be faithful to the Lord and they're hurting my feelings. What? That's what church is about. To help each other in the race of faith. To encourage each other to be faithful. And the writer of Hebrews says the next verse, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. What is the day? The day of Christ coming for his own. The closer we get to Christ coming for his own is not a time to neglect 
the assembly with other believers, you ought to be more faithful to Christ. The more prophetic truth we know of Christ coming for His own, it ought to encourage us to be more faithful. For Christ to come in the air and to catch you at Lake Williams when your church is assembled here. Man, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. <laughs> what? The worship of God? The study of His Word? And being out in the lake is more important than that? Are you kidding me? We ought not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, as some Christians are doing. So much the more as you see that day. Is come, that day is closer than ever before. God has placed all the pieces of the puzzle, and he's holding back the dam of his wrath. Zechariah, a prophet that lived 2,500 years ago, spoke of the same coming of Christ as Israel dwelling in their own land in unrepentance, repenting and looking to Christ who comes in the air to save them. That could not have taken place before 1948. Today it can. But God has placed them back in their land in unbelief. All the pieces of the puzzle that are necessary for Christ to come back. It's not coincidence. Oh, what a wonderful coincidence. Oh, I can't believe this. This is coincidence. This is an accident. It is not. It is God setting the stage for history. Because history is his story. It's his story. He's in control. We ought to be faithful. Number three, the truth of the rapture should cause us to have holy conduct, to grow in holiness and practical sanctification. In 1 John 3, 2, John is writing to Christians, says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be in the future. But we know that when He, when He, Jesus, shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're going to be like Christ in this sense. We'll have a perfect, unchanging, immortal body like his. And then he says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Those who believe that with all their hearts, it will affect the way they live. Listen, if you got a letter... From the government, from the IRS, those are the worst letters to get. <laughs> the IRS told you, we're going to come, and we want to see some of your paperwork on your, your, your rental or your home. We want to see this paperwork, and we're coming tomorrow at 3 o'clock. I guarantee, man, you would get ready. You would clean the living room, get mad at your kids when they spill their food. You would get all things ready, man. You would be prepared. Because the government usually doesn't play around saying, we're going to come, and then they don't come, especially when it deals with their money. You know they're coming if they want their money. And you would, you would be prepared for that. That would affect the way you live. And when a person embraces the truth that Christ can come back at any time in the air for his own, it ought to encourage holiness of life. No, it's not pie in the sky theology. We're going to sit on the roof and wait for the rapture. What? Don't you understand? The truth of God is given to us to live holy, sanctified, sold out lives for Christ now. Those who have this hope will purify themselves. They're not going to say, well, man, you know, I'm really pretty mature for a Christian. Yeah, I really know enough. What? There's much growth left in our lives. And the, this truth of the rapture ought to encourage us to grow in holiness of life. Two years after the wildfires of 2003, San Diego authorities establish a reverse 911 system where instead of you calling 911, 911 would call you. If it was a major catastrophe of some sort, 911 would call you on your phone. It would say 911. <laughs> and they would call you and tell you you're in danger. You need to evacuate. In 2007, they had major wildfires again. This time they had a system installed, the reverse 911. Many people were warned on their cell phones at their home, 911, get out of the area because of the fires. Many people took heed. They listened to that warning and they got out. Many didn't. Many said, I don't know who that is. Voicemail. I don't know who that is. Telemarketer. I don't know 911. I didn't call 911. Why would they call me? Voicemail. Many ignored it. And as a result, 
They paid with their lives. God had sounded the warnings loud and clear through His Word. The firestorm of His wrath that this world has never seen before. At a level the world has never seen before. The firestorm of His wrath, the seven-year tribulation period, when no Christian influence will temper the evil of this world. What did God say before the flood? My spirit will not always strive with man. The picture there is the person of the Holy Spirit holding back evil. You say, man, God's holding back evil? Delano's pretty evil. And God's holding back evil. If God's hand of restraint is removed from a society, it will go nuts. It will go morally nuts, morally perverse, and it will have a reprobate mind that doesn't work. God's spirit doesn't always strive with man. There'll be time when, when God's restraint by his spirit and church age believers will be removed. All hell will be unloosed on earth and God's wrath, his fury that's been built up will be unleashed on this world. The reverse 911 message God has given us is in his word. You can avoid God's wrath and be evacuated. So how can you avoid God's wrath? By personal faith in Christ. Because only Christ has, the wrath of God has only burned fully in one place. In one place has the wrath of God been quenched, and that is on Mount Calvary. He's risen from the dead and receives any and all sinners who will repent of their sin and place their faith solely in Christ. Those who come to Christ can be guaranteed, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, that we will be delivered from the wrath to come. It will be worse if you are unconverted and you enter this time of tribulation. For those that reject the gospel now, you will not be saved then. In fact, we know that from 2 Thessalonians 2. God will make sure you believe a lie to damn you. But today is a day of grace. God welcomes sinners with open arms to his son. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the hope that you have given us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, Father, you have provided a perfect Savior in the Lord Jesus Christ. Almighty God, Father and Son, we thank Thee for sending the Holy Spirit that He would open our eyes to our own sinfulness and rebellion and enable us to flee to Jesus Christ by faith. Father, we pray that You would be glorified, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this morning as Your Word has been proclaimed that as a result of believing Your truth, that it would result in faithfulness of living for your glory. Sanctify your people through your word. Your word is truth. Help us, O Lord, to grow in grace as believers. Help us as we examine our own lives under the teaching of your word. As our heads are bowed, I'll take a couple of moments to pray quietly, and then we'll close in a word of prayer together in just a few moments. Let's, let's pray.